Carlene Tyler, for those of you that don't know me. <laughs> um, and this afternoon, we're in for a treat. We brought in Carol Barr, who works with the freshman year program at the college. And I think you'll find it pretty uh, interesting, uh, kind of the detail that goes into, into the freshman program now at the college. So um, I think we'll get started. And uh, this is Carol Barr. Tell me what your title is now. <laughs> I'm the director of academic development for the college. Um, so basically, I do a lot of the academic support services, tutoring, and I work with the early warning system so that faculty can let us know about students that are struggling. And um, let's see. And then I do the first year programming. So. Okay, she and I worked really closely <coughs> together when I was in the registrar's office and, and became great friends. She has a lot of energy, so hold <laughs> on to your seats. And Carol, go ahead. Hi, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so today I am going to talk to you specifically about our first year programming at McPherson College. And um, I think although we have a lot of programs, when, when uh, a lot of you went to school when I went to college, there were, there were not first year programming. Did you have a first year seminar or program at McPherson College or wherever you went to school? No. I mean, your parents kind of dropped you off and you <laughs> did your thing, right? Um, now, it's a little bit different. The first year experience program is uh, it's a nationwide program. Uh, programs that most colleges, most large colleges, small colleges have them to help students adjust and, and uh, transition to college life. Um, our program at McPherson College has basically kind of three um, planks to it. We have our orientation, which most colleges have an orientation. You probably went through some kind of orientation when you went, even if it was just one day. Ours is three days. Um, academic Community Essentials class, which is what we call a first year experience class. And a first year experience class, they have giant seminars where nationally you get together and talk about your first year experience course. I went to one and thousands of people showed up to talk about their first year experience course at their college. So this is a big, big thing, big trend now in, in higher ed. And we have one at McPherson College, and we had one long before most most um, colleges had one actually. We were, you know, one of the beginning um, kind of uh, forefront in that, that area. And then residential education. So the education that takes place in our dormitories. Um, most of our campus is residential, so most of our students live on campus. We have a few that commute who are nearby McPherson or Lyons or areas like that, but a majority of our students at McPherson College live on the campus. Um, so when we look at all this, um, basically what we're trying to do is help our students transition. So if you can think back to when you went to college, um, what were some of the things you felt? Your parents dropped you with your bags in, in front of the college, maybe at McPherson College. How many people went to McPherson? Okay, <laughs> you, you, you've been there. Um, what were some of the feelings that you felt at the time? Do you remember what you were feeling? Were you nervous? Were you, what do you think? Anybody? You had a big sister? Yeah, it was a senior that I had. I, most, I don't know if the girls and guys both did, but we did have somebody. Okay, so that, did that help you kind of transition? Good, okay, great, all right. Good, so kind of a peer mentoring model that helped you transition. Anybody else, anything you remember distinctly about your first year? Homesickness. Homesickness. When we have a lot of students who are from far away, and you're from the East Coast, you were from the East Coast, correct? Is that right? East Coast people? So, um, I think a lot of our students, they come from all over the country. So we have students from everywhere, from East Coast, from West Coast, and they do. A lot of students get really homesick in those first couple weeks, especially even the first couple months. So that's something they definitely face. Anything else that you remember specifically about your first year? Yes. I shouldn't talk again, but a friend of mine, I was from Iowa, gave me a huge wardrobe truck to bring my stuff in. We came on a train. And the guys at the dorm had to carry that thing up to the third floor, and I never brought it back another year. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still like that. I see poor fathers dragging all these things up the dorm steps, and when they come back the second year, they don't bring as much stuff. That is true. <laughs> so wanting to have all your things with you. Um, so obviously, students are nervous. They're afraid. Um, it's a big transition for a lot of students. And so our programs are designed, hopefully, to help them um, kind of acclimate to 
um, what's going to happen. So it's change, right? And change can be really scary. Um, I think for all of us, I mean, even as adults, when we face change, those things are really difficult for all of us. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is not just set students up to make that transition to college life, but to make those transitions that we'll make through all of life. So we're trying to give them life skills. That's the student development piece of it. So we're going beyond just, hey, let's make it through our freshman year, to let's work together to gain those skills that you'll need when you're transitioning to being married, when you're transitioning to moving to a new city, when you're transitioning to a new job. So our first step is to kind of acclimate through orientation. I think you just said that you had peer mentors, and we have that as well. Um, first, we want to give them a group. So we have our ACE groups, which is a class during the fall semester, but during orientation, they're with that group. They're put in a group. This year, they were put there by majors, so they're with people in their major to help them meet people that they would have classes with throughout the time they're at McPherson College. Um, so they meet their peer group through orientation. They do a lot of activities um, for, that are group bonding activities. They do fun stuff. They go to movies. They go bowling, they do scavenger hunts to find resources on campus, all of that's things that you probably did um, when you were in college at some point, finding your resources, bonding with your peers. And then we have our mentor program. Our ACE mentors, that's what we call our freshman seminar piece, um, are upper level students that are chosen by a committee to help lead our freshmen. So each group has an ACE mentor um, that is going to help lead that group. So they're kind of the contact person, um, anything from where do I go? to find out about my financial aid that can help students in that way, help them talk through courses that they might want to take um, as they plan for the next year. They can talk with them about being homesick. Um, so all those types of things. They go through a rigorous training program before a freshman ever get there. So they're training for a week before our freshmen get on campus so they can learn how to work with our freshman students. The second part is what we call self-authorship. And um, basically, to all of us, that's like deciding what you believe in and who you are, basically, is what they're trying to do. Um, surprisingly enough, um, a lot of our students are not thinking about what they believe as much as we all did when we were um, going through those stages. Um, this generation, very specifically, when they're in K through 12, they're playing to a test. We know that no child left behind, our students are being tested. You know, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, I wouldn't say, but we're losing a lot of that creative and critical thinking um, that we did in the classroom, that we did as we were out facing the world, okay? A lot of our students now, um, when they come home from school, they are staying inside. Their parents don't want them outside. They're worried about their safety and those types of things. So the world has changed a lot in that way, and it's limited them in critical thinking. That's something that people see in higher ed across the board. Um, I don't know if you you've noticed it in you know students of this generation or not but it's something they definitely um, have seen in all um, higher education institutions people have said yeah our freshmen are not thinking at the level that we've seen in previous years um, what we chose this year was this book called this I believe too and it's really a bunch of essays by all different kinds of people and it, they're just making short page and a half statements about what they believe so it's this I believe, and it's everything from, you know, you should tip your pizza guy, <laughs> which the students love that one, um, to really deep things like should you tell kids about death? And what should you tell them about death? So um, they read an essay, they read like five essays a week, they write on one, reflect on one, and then we discuss those in class. And we've had some amazing discussions in class. Um, the, the topics that they've been willing to talk about, the things that they've been willing to um, you know, share about themselves, about their, their own lives, and, and about the people that they know. And they've, they've said, hey, I never thought about that before. Um, so I think we have gotten them thinking through the book, um, which has been really good, and it covers all different kinds of topics. The second piece is we're using the um, Pauli and Elder method of critical thinking. Now, I have to say, when I went to a critical thinking conference, I was like, okay, so now we're gonna teach people how to think. <laughs> it seems a little sort of like, hmm, do we need to do that? But we actually do, because we're finding out that our students aren't kind of taking in all of the information they need to make good critical decisions. They're very much making a knee-jerk reaction to whatever happens to them, um, and not thinking through the consequences, not thinking about what could happen. Um, 
And so the Pauli and Elder method of critical thinking, we're using this small critical thinking guide. This is actually like a 40 page little pamphlet book. It's very small. Um, but basically what it does is gives them a framework to think about critically making decisions. So what they're doing is they're kind of learning a process, a method um, to go through to think critically. When they come to us, we like to think they're probably naive thinkers, okay? Obviously, you can tell from the photo, this probably isn't going to end well um, for the sheep, you know? A little concerned about that. Um, and of course, the man who's standing there guiding him, he's got his, his shepherd's crook there, he's standing there, um, looks like, hey, you could follow this guy, right? Um, and we find that our students will follow a lot of people they shouldn't be following. Um, we've all succumbed to peer pressure at one point in our life, um, but we find out with the naive thinker, with our students, when they first get there, they're looking to find their group, okay? And sometimes they get in with the wrong folks. And so one of the things we're trying to do with using the critical thinking is to kind of combat this naive type of thinking. The other one that we see um, when, when first the students first come to us is the selfish thinker. It's kind of my way or the highway, right? How many of you had a roommate when you were in college? Okay. <laughs> How many of you shared a room when you were at home, living at home with your parents? Okay, most people have. When I ask our students, they have most of them never shared a room before they came to college. So they have never lived in the same room with another student. This my way or the highway thing causes a lot of problems <laughs> in that situation. They want things the way they want them. So we're spending a lot of time working with them on those type of issues. So Residence Life spends a lot of time helping students navigate through that. So one of the things we're trying to do in ACE is let's give you a framework for thinking about whether you're being fair about your interactions with your roommate. And they talk about that stuff a lot in the ACE seminar class. Those things will come up as we're talking. Um, so we're trying to move away from those two types of thinking to be a fair-minded thinker. Um, and basically, I use the peace sign as an example of this just because if we're being fair-minded, hopefully we're considering all people, right? I mean, we're, we're considering ourselves as well, um, but we're going to have a more um, global viewpoint. We're going to have a more um, educated viewpoint and that we're taking in more information before we make decisions. So that's our goal, basically, with teaching critically th critical thinking. Um, when we talk to our students about it, we say the one big thing um, that is a problem for students is assumptions that they make. And the chart tells you unconscious thoughts are really our assumptions. And we all have them, right? You look at someone, you immediately assume, oh, they look like this and so this. And you put them in a category. And that's human nature. But when we're not aware of our assumptions, that's when we make mistakes in thinking. And most of our students haven't had enough time on their own making their own decisions to really even think about, what am I thinking when I made that choice? Voice. And I always say to the students, <laughs> how many times have you said, so what was he thinking? You know, was he even thinking? You know, and so <laughs> that's one of the things they'll say about each other. And I'm like, okay, so think, what were the assumptions that he didn't think about? What was he not taking into consideration? Um, our students are thinking that they go from gathering information to making their decisions or their conclusion or their inferences. But in fact, there's a whole lot of other things they need to consider. And when they get to college, all those assumptions that work sometimes in a smaller environment at home with people they've known their whole life aren't going to necessarily work in the big college environment. So this is the wheel of thought that we give them. So the parts of thinking that are part, that's part of the Pauli and Elder method of thinking, just to go around the wheel, and it looks like, well, OK, obviously you should do this, right? Um, so you start with the purpose of your thinking. Why are you thinking about this? Is it relevant to think about it? Are you wasting your time? Are you worrying for no reason? So what are you thinking about and why? And then questions that you're trying to answer. One of the problems that students have, like even when they're writing term papers, is they'll, they'll say, OK, my topic is going to be, um, oh, sure. It is kind of, there we go. Um, the students will, um, they'll have a topic. They'll pick a topic. It'll be the Vietnam War. And they tell the professor they want that to be their topic. <laughs> that's kind of large. Um, so you have to, of course, find a pertinent question that's going to be the thesis for your paper. So this works in academic uh, endeavors just like it does in personal matters. So what are you trying, what are the questions you're trying to answer? What are you addressing? Then you're going to gather information. This is a step that sometimes students skip as well. So they go straight from this is what I think 
and this is the truth, and now I'm making a conclusion about it, right? But in fact, there may be other points of view and other information they need to gather. Um, and then they go to their inferences or conclusions. What do they think about it? Um, this one is a hard one to get students to think about, and it's the key concepts. So every time we think about something, so let's say one of the examples we used in um, our class setting was talking about um, divorce and children and how it affects children. Uh, so as we were talking about that, everybody had very you know, different opinions, different stories about how that had affected them in their life. And um, we talk about what concepts does that, does that hit up against, does that butt up against. So if you make a decision about what you think about divorce, what else does that affect? Okay. So it affects what you think about marriage. It affects the law and what you think about the law. It affects um, you know, what you think about the welfare of children. What does it take for children to be safe? So there's other concepts. When you make a decision about one thing, it will influence what you do in other areas. And that's another thing. Sometimes our students think they're making a random, isolated decision. Okay? And it's not going to affect other things. But in fact, it is. Um, so we talk about that. Then the assumptions piece, which is huge, of course. What, do you, what, is the, what other information have you gathered in your lifetime that may be true or false that is coloring your decisions and looking at that? Um, then the implications or consequences of your thinking. Obviously, that's very important for us, especially in residence life. Um, if you're going to do that, what will happen? You need to think through the pieces of what will happen and why. And then the final thing is the points of view and perspective. So you can't just consider yourself to be a fair-minded thinker. You must consider others, right? So who, what, what were the other players that are going to be involved? What are the other um, things that you need to think about and how it will affect others? Um, once we've kind of done our critical thinking piece, and we practice that in various ways. We read short little articles, like the one about divorce, and I ask them to give their opinions about that. Um, we ask them to write about a situation where they made a poor decision, and to think about that wheel of thought and point out what areas they think they missed. What steps did you skip that got you into trouble in that situation? Um, we look at a variety of different sources, textbook chapters, um, journal entries, and we talk about those in class as well. Then we go to our career planning, academic planning. That's what I've been doing this week. <laughs> We're working on a four-year academic plan. That sounds like, wow, they're freshmen, they're supposed to know what they're going to do all four years. Um, but it's amazing when you see them look at the requirement classes, and Carlene definitely knows how this is. <laughs> their eyes, when they see all those classes they have to take to get their degrees, they're like, I have to take all those classes? Yeah, you do. All those classes will be required for your degree. Uh, so when they see what it's going to take, that gives them some idea of what's going to happen and helps them plan. And they, usually most of them will say, wow, I've got a lot of work to do. You know? And it gives them an idea of, I've got to pass this class to take this class. If I don't pass this class, I can't take this one. So they, they get an idea about what their decisions are going to mean. If I don't pass intro to auto restoration, I can't take any more auto restoration classes next semester. I have to pass that course. Okay? If I don't pass bio one, I can't take bio two with everyone else. So they start to see when they're doing that planning what the implications of that is. That that will be. Um, and then the other piece is the career piece. Katie Sawyer, our career services director, comes in and talks with them, and then they can meet with her one-on-one -on -one if they're concerned about, I don't know what may I want my major to be. I've had a lot of students this semester who have thought, I have thought I wanted to do this, and now I don't. Um, they say the average college student now changes their major seven times. Um, I don't think they like change it on paper that much. Do you think so, Carly? <laughs> I think they may in their mind, and they may tell their parents seven different things, which about gives them a heart attack, of course. But um, they work towards that um, and trying to find out what career you want to do and what major you'd need for that. So Katie works with them on that. Um, our final step is our residential um, education programming. And this year we actually did have, and I don't know how many of you may have experienced um, having like freshman halls, this way we mean hall, a floor, uh, we don't have entire dorms. How many people lived in like just with freshmen when they went to college, anyone? Nobody, okay, so that's pretty. Um, and most colleges now will have all freshman dormitories. Um, we don't do that, we just do halls of dormitories. So um, they're doing that this year for the first time. Did they do that before at McPherson College? Do you think, Carlene, do you remember a time when we had freshmen? Four? Okay, <laughs> so, so we're doing it for the first time, I'll venture to say, first time in recent years anyway. Um, 
And that's been something that's been different. The freshmen tell us that they actually like it. Um, I wasn't sure whether they were going to like it or not. The, the, it was hopefully to help them bond as a group. And they actually say they like it. They like being able to talk with this other students who are having similar issues and meet new people who want to meet other people, not who already have a friend group. So they've enjoyed that part of it. Um, and part of being the freshman halls was our doing the freshman needs assessment. I don't know if any of you know Sarah Neer, who is, um, was a graduate of McPherson College um, and uh, worked with Church of the Brethren Services for quite a while and now is working with us. And she did um, the freshman needs assessment with our students and our resident assistants, where they basically ask students four open-ended questions. Um, for example, what's the biggest challenge that you've had since you arrived at McPherson College? Um, you know, what do you, um, do you have a peer group that you feel comfortable with. So we're just asking them questions to see, gauge how they're doing. Um, and then we took that information and tried to roll it into our programming for um, the halls. Um, the other piece that we do is academic programming. So we did a thing on time management, um, and Sarah worked with them. We've worked with them on their academic plans, you know, through the dormitories. Um, and we did various uh, activities to hopefully get them up to snuff as far as academics go. Um, and most of our students this year, I think, are pretty well prepared. They really, this, this group seems like they're doing um, uh, very well on the academic side, I think. Um, so we've done some work there with them. And then the social development piece. That's coping strategies. Like this month, Sarah's doing all coping strategies um, to help them cope with be doing finals and being stressed about that. Um, so all that is driven by the freshman needs assessment. So we're doing that third piece, which is in the dormitories. Um, our goal, hopefully, is that if we get them you know, through their first year by using the support services that we have for them, they will, of course, be you know, happy, healthy, successful freshmen. They'll survive their first year and gain life skills, so they'll learn to be able to be more resilient, um, and they'll become our ideal McPherson College graduate through scholarship participation and service, which, of course, is our mission. We start out our orientation with one day for scholarship, one day for participation, one day for service. Um, and so they're indoctrinated kind of into that, um, uh, our theme at McPherson College for their freshman year, which is our mission. Um, I think for most of our students, what we find is that um, they are resilient in some personal ways. They've been through a lot a lot of times. They've experienced a lot more um, than students maybe did 20 years ago. Um, but they still don't quite have um, the skills to tackle when they don't do well, okay? So they may be able to go through a personal matter and come out okay, but academically when they're challenged a lot of times, they, they kind of shut down when they don't do well. So that's what we're trying to do is hopefully give them those skills that when things don't go their way, that they're able to kind of step up to the plate and get back going again. And so the freshman program is kind of designed um, to work with that. Um, we hope that uh, kind of adding the new residential pieces will be uh, successful for the college. Um, um, and in the words of Roger Tremel, it's a great day to be a bulldog. We're hoping for all of our students. Um, and uh, I think this year especially, um, we have a class of 194 freshman students. Um, so that's pretty large for McPherson College. I think um, between 68 and 70 of those are auto restoration students. Um, and those students come from all over the country. So we have a lot of students from um, far away this year. Um, we have, I think, more general students than we've had in some previous years, so students who are not involved in athletic endeavors or in auto restoration. Um, and so far, they're, they're looking pretty good. They're pretty good bulldogs. So. On the freshman halls, you said that freshmen like it. What about, what about the people in charge? Are they liking those freshman halls? Well, I got to tell you, <laughs> just saw one of my freshman RAs today, uh, and they were hired to work specifically with freshmen. So when we hired our residence assistants for those halls, um, we asked them, you know, do you want to work with freshmen? And she looked at me and she said, I don't think I want to work with freshmen again. <laughs> like, oh, we're halfway through the semester. But this is a hard time for freshmen. They just, you know, they got their midterm grades. They may not be doing as well as they thought they were going to be. They're, they're struggling a little bit. And obviously, she was kidding. I mean, she loves her freshmen. Um, but it is very challenging to have all freshmen as compared to having some upperclassmen in there who can help you out a little bit more when you're resident assistant. They're also expected to do more as far as interacting with the residents and planning activities for the residents. So it's a little higher, higher demand um, than just being a, an RA on a regular floor. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, what 
curious, why do they, uh, what is, what's the biggest reason why they leave, and what's the biggest reason why they stay? That's a really good question. And, and I, on the leaving, I wish that I knew the answer. I mean, I've, I've talked to a lot of students who were on, you know, going through the exit process. And I think one of the things, sadly, is that McPherson is small. I mean, we do hear from students that they, they, the, the, it's a very small community, and some students are from bigger areas and they want a bigger community, you know. Um, but then I've had students from LA who, who don't want to leave McPherson when they graduate, you know. So that's a hard one to tell, but I hear that. Um, I think another reason um, uh, sometimes is um, a personal nature. So either they're super homesick, or um, you know they feel they've figured out college really isn't for them. I mean, right now we really push kids to go to college. I mean, they start in middle school telling every student they should go to college. You know, um, and so I think some kids get there and they think it's going to be easier than it is, and they realize that's not what they want to do. So, Carlene, do you know other like other big reasons that our freshmen leave? What do you think? Well, I mean, to, sometimes if I always felt like if a student didn't get tied, in, an athlete that didn't get tied in some other way mm -hmm. to the college, and they got disappointed with with athletics, mm -hmm. that usually seemed to be one thing. And I think when we to address that issue, one of the things that we tried to do was to put majors with the um, ACE groups, with their freshman groups, which we hadn't done before. Um, I think we did it one other time, didn't we? Yeah, we tried. Uh, so, but I, and I think that was helpful in that way because they weren't just connected to their athletic team, they were also connected to people in their major. So we're hoping that will help in the long run. But yeah, I think that's true because a lot of times people come and they think they're gonna play college athletics their freshman year or something and it doesn't work out the way they want it to. Um, and that can be problematic for them too. And I think financial, I mean, we have to face the fact that that is another reason. You know, I mean, I think people don't realize how much it costs to go to college, and it is just darned expensive nowadays, you know. Um, and I think that can sometimes be a reason. Yes? Do you have to deal with helicopter parents? Oh. Goodness, yeah. <laughs> Somebody, a colleague said to me at a, a freshman seminar conference the, uh, this past year, she said, you know what, I think we've gone from helicopter to bulldozer. She said, they're not flying above up now, they're swooping down and trying to push everything that may stop their children or be an obstacle for their children out of the way. Um, so yes, we do, an awful lot. And you know, um, you know, God bless them because they want the best for their children. I mean, seriously, it, it, it's not out of any malice that parents ever do that, but sometimes that really does hinder their children, you know? Um, and I think the fact that we, um, parents feel like they're rushed for time, they're working, both parents may be working, and so they want to have a really intense experience with their children, whether it's doing schoolwork with them afterwards, and you know, sometimes they feel like they're left alone too long, so they're supervising a whole lot, and then for them to just let that go when their child comes to college is difficult. So yeah, I mean, we have parents who log into our learning platform and look at their students' grades every week. Um, well, that's what they've done all their lives. Yeah, yeah. And so it's very, I mean, we had some challenges in that area, didn't we, Carlene? I mean, <laughs> do, do you work with parents, parenting? Do you uh, have orientation for parenting? <laughs> I'm serious. No, no, and that's a very good question. And I think we, we have, through the years, done a variety of different things. Um, one of the things that we used to do, and we did not do this past year, but one of the things that we used to do was the ACE advisors, so the advisors for the freshman seminar course, the faculty advisor, would meet with the students. Like our mentors would take the, the, the um, incoming freshmen away, and we would meet with the parents and kind of tell them, you know, hey, this is... You know, I could help you with these problems. These are the type of things that you might experience with your child. These are the things they might say or do or feel and try to give them a little bit of groundwork, you know. Um, and that was both good and bad. Don't you think, Carlene? Carlene's laughing back Because <laughs> sometimes they would call us about everything. <laughs> like, oh, I shouldn't have given them that card. But of course, we don't mean that. But, um, but they do tend to be over-involved. So I mean, we, we, we put the hints out there um, and, and hope that they're going to um, understand that you know, at some point, you've got to let them go. You know? um, but as far as you know, actual parenting, instruction no but we do try to let them know what's going to happen what they can expect but 
I mean, having a little 101 class on, on having your student go to college probably wouldn't be a bad idea, you know? I mean, how, many of you, how many of your parents helped you develop your college schedule, class schedule? Wow. We nearly had, you know, a mutiny on our hands when we asked the parents to find another activity while we helped <laughs> yeah. their students <laughs> get enrolled. And then they came back and looked at the schedules their students had developed and said, no, 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 this is all wrong and wanted to, to talk with Carlene about correcting those. So it's very, I mean, that part's very, very different. So yeah, they definitely, and I think with the roommate issues, we have that too. With roommate issues, the parents will call us about the student roommate issues. And the student's not dealing with, you know, so you have to say, hey, let's let John deal with that with his roommate and we'll help him talk through that. Um, but I do, yeah, it's definitely, the helicopter parent is, it's definitely there. It's definitely there. <laughs> Sometimes the bulldozer, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's different. Yes. And I somewhat blame that on our high schools and our grade schools. Because back in my day, you had to earn your grade if you you didn't get to do something else for extra points and, and um, you had to know your homework or you got penalized for not showing up with it. Where today I see parents don't let their children have the repercussions of not and not earning, they're not earning their grades like we had to earn them. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I mean, that accountability there for the child, I think they don't develop that in high school, and then we throw them out there in college and say, hey, yeah, take care of that, you know? Um, and they have trouble with that. And one of the pieces in freshman seminar that I've done this year is um, I'm teaching all 14 sections of the freshman seminar. So I have all of the freshmen. Before we had different advisors doing that. Um, and one of the things that I've done is said, here's the deal. These are your homework assignments. I tell them each week what the homework assignment is. The, the assignment is due at the beginning of the class period. If you don't hand it in, you get a zero. You can't hand it in late. You can't hand it in at the end of the semester. You, you know, it's like now or never. You know, and um, they've actually a majority of them have done great with that. They missed the first assignment. And they're like, "Holy cow, she's serious! I got a zero. <laughs> and they're they're stepping up to the plate with it. So I think sometimes our expectation is not high enough. You know, that may be poor teaching. I hate to say, but on our parts. Um, and when we put the standard higher, I think they can do that. And I think they will do that. But in high school, they get away with it all. They do. And then they get to college, and it's like, oh, what's, what's going on? They don't know how to, they don't, you, you understand what yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. Because I know in high schools, I've had several of my students tell me they didn't do any work all semester long and then hand it in at the end of the year. And they still got the same grade as someone who did it when they were supposed to. I mean, that never would have happened in previous generations. You know, it just wouldn't have happened. Um, so our students are thinking, I missed a couple assignments, no big deal. And I'm not saying all of them think this, but some of them are thinking, oh, it's, it's fine, it's good. You know, and then all of a sudden it's like, why did I have an F at downgrades? Well, you didn't turn in any work. You've got to turn something in. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of surprising to them, sadly enough, you know. Yes? Well, and I think in high school you have your classes every day, pretty much. In college, three times a week or two times a week, mm -hmm. and you get a, a feeling that, well, there's no big rush about this or something, and then these term papers come up and you haven't even started. Oh, what do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely true. And time management supposedly is the number one reason when they poll college students about why they failed, they feel like time management was one of their biggest um, shortcomings, that juggling everything. And our students are so involved. I mean, we love participation. You know, we love it. But, you know, they're doing, they're busy 24 hours a day. Even just to find a time to meet with them in the evening is really difficult, like with our mentors and things. I mean, they are busy with athletics and they're, you know, on student activities board and they're, you know, doing a club. And so they've got so many things going on. Um, but that's one of the things that we did in our dorm programming was time management sat down made him do
do schedules. Where are your empty blocks? What time are you wasting playing video games? What, you know, so they could see what they're really doing with their time. Um, most of them were not keeping daily planners, which you know, for us, to, you know, most of us, we have some way that we're tracking what we're doing in our day, and they weren't doing that. So that's to do that is really helpful to get them started on that. They all had to do it in junior high and high school, and they don't like it. They did it all through middle school and high school. Like I'm done with that. <laughs> no, you really can't be. <laughs> Got to keep track of stuff. So. But it's difficult, that accountability piece is hard. And largely because of the, I mean, helicopter parenting, I think, you know, it's not put out there to them. I hate to blame parents, I am one. I have a college sophomore, so. <laughs> Any other questions? You know, um, I, I have to say, since I came to McPherson College um, six years ago, I think six years ago, when I got here, um, we really have a lot of diversity in our student population. I mean, we really do. People come from all over, all different types of people from everywhere. Um, and so we have so -so socioeconomic diversity. We have, obviously, racial diversity. We have a lot more international students this year than we've had in previous years. So we have a, a, a huge group of people all trying to work together. And I think overall, um, I can say about our faculty with just uh, being completely honest with you, um, our faculty is so willing to work with students um, and, and no matter what that need is, no matter you know, what ground they're meeting them on, um, as I'm talking with them, because that's a large part of my job in working with early morning, um, which is the system the faculty uses to alert us if students are struggling. Um, so if there are issues that are connected with diversity even, we can address those issues, whether it be socioeconomic or, or background, whatever. Um, I think we do a good job of addressing that on campus. Now I think with our student body as a whole, it's really interesting because our freshmen, we've had so many dialogues in our ACE sessions about diversity. And they have, their views are just, they're, they're like, hey, you know, everybody should be treated completely equal. And they're all telling me that. Um, and then when we ask about, would you be willing to express your view, uh, we talk about the intellectual traits, and one of those is um, intellectual courage. And when we talk about would you be willing to express your view, a lot of them are like, eh, not so much. So that's one of the things we've really been working on, um, because I think to have a, an acceptance of diversity in your campus, you know, you're going to have to confront when you don't, when that isn't being, um, you aren't being fair-minded. And so um, talking to students about the idea of, are you willing to stand up for someone else? Are you willing to um, express your viewpoint? Um, and I think they're, they're working on that, but I think they're developing that. Um, I asked them why they thought a lot of them didn't have intellectual courage, why they, they what their reasoning um, might be. And what somebody brought up to me, they thought it was social media, which I thought was really, I never would have thought, you're shaking your head like you, I never would have thought of that. I don't know why, but yeah, I mean, they said, you know, in social media, you can get out there and say whatever you want, and nobody's going to, and people are going to just, you know, go after you or whatever, but you could even say it anonymously, you could, but um, there's nobody who's going to respond to you person to person. And so they said that they have kind of a fear about putting their viewpoint out and having people respond to them uh, when it's person to person. And I, I mean, I, it's, I, that really surprised me. Um, but they don't want conflict. They, they're more than willing to have it on, on the internet. <laughs> but, you know, really call each other out and be nasty or whatever. But they're not going to do that one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So I thought that was very interesting. We've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, this semester, because I would not have thought that that would be something that would kind of curtail their their intellectual courage, they're willing to express their viewpoints. Yes? Uh, I appreciate the role you are in, and one way I would have of talking about that is encouraging and developing uh, students to assume responsibility for their own academic process, mm -hmm. their own learning process. That, that uh, we live in a time when people uh, want to be spoon fed or funnel fed or whatever yeah and, and uh, you're you're trying to get at that yeah, I mean, that is the goal. And when I talked with Dr. Clary, our Vice President of Academic Affairs, that was one of the things that um, we talked about as being a goal. Um, the attendance policy for ACE is very, I mean, we take attendance in the class and you're expected to be there. Um, and if you're not, you fail. I mean, it's like there's accountability for your education here. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's definitely more academically rigorous and the expectation is higher than it has been in previous years, I think, um, with this, this um, 
academic year. And I think that is because exactly what you are talking about, that we do feel, and our students are bright. Oh my gosh, as I read what they write and I talk to them, they're lovely people who've been through a lot and they have tons of insight. You know, I just, I'm like, wow, you guys are incredible. And they are, they're just amazing. Um, but I think sometimes getting, you know, following through and having the self-discipline and those are things that are challenging to them that maybe weren't as challenging in previous generations, I think. I really do. Um, because of that funnel feeding, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's true. Anyone else? I dislike it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and I think as parents, it, it's, it comes out of something positive and that they want to have interaction. They don't have a lot of time and they want to have this intense interaction with their children. And I completely understand that. But that comes into this micromanaging. And, and, um, and one of the things we've talked about most this year, um, which the students have been very engaged in these conversations, and I've been really pleased about that, is that the fact that failure is part of learning that you will fail. We all know, oh my gosh, there's none of us in this room that can't raise our hands and say, we've never failed, you know? Um, and, and readdressing failure as, as not loss, but gain. Saying, you know, you fail and you gain information. When you look at your wheel of thought, you've gained more information about whatever it is that you're doing or thinking about when you fail. Um, so not to encourage failure, but to, to let them know that's a part of life, you know? I think they're so afraid that they're gonna make a mistake that half the time they're not willing to try. I mean, they're not gonna step outside of that, you know? Um, they're very, very, very worried about that. Um, but, you know, they've had great conversations about, you know, what that means, and I think there, a lot of them are, are realizing. The essays in the book, if you ever have a chance to read the book, I would highly recommend it. Um, we're reading the, this, I believe, too, the second version, and they, the kids, they've just, they really have done a great job with it. I mean, they're short, so it's easy to read. Um, you know, they've been reading, they write about it weekly, they talk about it weekly in class, and I think some of those concepts are coming in there, that you, you know, you're going to have to be resilient, that you're going to have to fail, that you're going to have to learn and grow on your own. Um, and I think it's been really good for them. Yes? I understand we have a, a, quite a high percentage of first generation students, mm -hmm. which I applaud. I'm glad we're reaching that demographic. Is there any difference that you see when working with them of a first generation college student as opposed to somebody where a grandma and grandpa and everybody else went to college? Or? where the expectations were that you went to college. Do you see any difference there? You know, I, I think I do, and I hate to generalize in that way, but I think it's, I think you, it's a generalization you can make because um, with first-generation students, and I see people when they're, you know, in my role as, an, as um, an academic advisor for freshmen and working with early warning, so students who are really struggling. Um, I work with probationary students too. I see students who um, are, are really, you know, at their low point. Um, but with first generation students, what you notice that's different is that they don't, they don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, they, they have not had anybody tell them, you go to college and this is the story of what's gonna happen to you and classes are gonna be really hard and you're gonna fail. You know, so a lot of times they haven't heard that that's part of the experience. They haven't had a parent who said, oh my gosh, I took calculus one and it just about killed me. Oh, that chemistry course, you know, they haven't heard those stories. Um, so they, they're not expecting that it's gonna be super challenging. You know, a lot of times they have, they've never been away from home very often either. So it's not like, um, you know, they've, they've gone off places and been away from family. And so I think that is also sometimes a little bit harder, that they, they um, are definitely um, missing their family and that support more because they're in such an unfamiliar environment. And navigating through the bureaucracy of it, Carlene, I mean, I, we, we really have tried to cut down on that at McPherson College. Honestly, it was one of our planks of one of our strategic planning um, initiatives at one time was to kind of cut down that bureaucracy. But even just to figure out how do you drop a class? How do you change a class? What do you do to get a book? How do you go online and buy a book? You know, all those types of things are also a challenge. Um, and then the biggest the biggest thing that I see I have to say is that once we hit the threshold where we aren't doing what we expected that we would do, the, the immediate reaction is to draw and shut down a lot of times. And this isn't for all first gen students, but it is a trend that I see um, when I'm working with students that it's like, uh oh, I'm not, I can't do this. You know, I don't know a bunch of other people who've sat in this seat and gone, ooh, I'm really struggling and kept going and been okay. You know, there's not that um, somebody saying, oh, you can do this. I had that terrible econ class. It was just so hard and I made it through you know um, 
And so they tend to shut down. So if you don't get to them right away, don't get to those students quickly and keep you know, saying, hey, you can do this. This is what happens. Failure is a part of life. You can pick yourself back up from this. We'll get you a tutor. Um, and sometimes that mentoring piece at that point is just colossal. It adds so much if they can have a peer that says, oh my gosh, this class was really hard for me too. Um, but I made it. And somebody that's been through that with them. So connecting them with those support services that we have can be really, really helpful. But yeah, it's, it's, I think it is challenging. It's challenging. And just even, you know, the, the going through the books and how do you go through and eat at the calf, all those things are, you know. There's yes. another side of that. And, and the question is, what can you learn from your failure? It's, it's reintroducing or thinking about failure in another. It, failure is very valuable. It's not just something mm -hmm. to be avoided. It's, it's uh, what can you learn from it? How can you benefit from it? Yeah, definitely. That was one of the essays that they read. Um, it was a man, I can't remember um, what his background story was, but he was talking about sending his, uh, his kindergartner granddaughter off to uh, kindergarten. He said, and I thought, you know, oh, I said, you know, you'll be fine. You're going to do great. You're going to be successful in school. She's a little nervous about going off. And he said, and all of a sudden, I thought in the back of my mind, no. I hope she knows she's going to fail, and I hope she's going to learn from all of those failures, and I hope she's going to realize that failure isn't the end of the world, that it isn't devastating, that all it does is give you more information to learn and grow and be. Um, and he talks about that in the essay. So the students got to talk about that, and I think it was, their conversation was very interesting about that exact um, point. So. Um, I think that was helpful to them to even think about it in that way. And they said, you know, we're afraid of failure. I mean, all people are, you know. And they said, but they felt like the expectation of always being perfect was very high for them, that that was something they felt a lot, you know. Um, and you talked about great inflation. And I think that's one of the things with great inflation is that, you know, everybody's going to get an A, you know. And you get to college and everybody doesn't. Everybody doesn't get an A. I think the whole connection between Fear of failure and not wanting conflict are very closely connected. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't, the students don't get that at all. I mean, okay, if, if I disagree or if I get in a, a conflict, that's failure to me mm -hmm. because that was, you know, so. Not agreeing with you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, conflict is also another thing that's just a part of life. I mean, they're going to have to learn to navigate it at some point. Are those things just part of reality? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> and I think, you know, um, in previous generations, there were other things that prepared them for that, you know. Um, and I don't, I don't think... They're quite, I mean, and overall, I mean, we have these, like I said, first year experience conferences where the big buzzword this past year was resilience and grit, you know? And uh, they have a grit uh, assessment to tell you how gritty your students are. Um, you know, but I think, so I think those things are, are things that across the board, everywhere in higher ed, people are not seeing, feeling like are, are lacking in their students. But I think part of that is just they haven't been allowed to try. They haven't been allowed to fail, a lot of them. You know, they've been kept in a pretty small environment that they just didn't have the chance to develop resilience in that way. Anything else? Thank you. Good discussion. You guys added a lot of insight to my... <laughs> gained some info from you. Thank you. Have a great day.